Thanks to Johnny Depp's amazing franchise, pirates have become these romantic and kind figures in today's world. In reality, they were even more colorful and eccentric. Today, we'll step into the shoes of an ordinary pirate from the Golden Age, where being a pirate was cooler than any other profession. Get ready for a wild ride through pirate history, folks. And joining us today is our special guest, Marcus Barbaroso, Rashford, yeah. Just like modern comedians, pirates loved adding funny nicknames in the middle of their names. Some pirates, like Bartolomeo the Portuguese, completely ditched their surnames and opted for their hometowns as nicknames. And hey, sometimes pirates even earn nicknames from their buddies. Take the legendary Algerian pirate Todinkov, for example, his nickname had nothing to do with mysticism. It was simply because the guy was as bald as a desert. Poor guy couldn't grow a single hair on his head. Now, our guest Marcus, before he became Barbarossa, got his nickname thanks to his vibrant red beard. You know, nicknames based on physical appearances were all the rage among pirates. Whether they were long, fat, sleepy, or had a single tooth, there was a nickname for every pirate out there. But some pirates didn't bother with creativity and just went for fake names. See, piracy doesn't have a specific era in history. Pirates have been around since the days of primitive raft raiders to the modern-day Somalis with machine guns. Pirates even get a mention in Homer's famous poem, The Odyssey. Talk about timeless troublemakers. 3,000 years ago, Phoenician pirates roamed the Mediterranean, although their main focus was raiding coastal villages rather than ships. In later eras, the line between pirates and merchants blurred. Every merchant sailing the seas had a crew of warriors, ready to seize any tempting vessel nearby. If they didn't find anything worthwhile, they'd switch gears and become regular merchants, making some honest money. Even the legendary Julius Caesar had a run-in with Cilician pirates who held him for ransom. And guess what? Once the ransom was paid, Caesar made sure those pirates met their fate while he feasted on some delicious cabbage rolls. It was around that time that piracy started being seen as a serious crime. However, governments soon realized that employing pirates could be a handy way to do some dirty work while keeping their hands clean. During wars, pirates, with their unparalleled knowledge of the sea, became true lifesavers. So, ladies and gentlemen, get ready to set sail on a thrilling adventure as we delve into the captivating world of pirates, where danger and laughter coexist in perfect harmony. ARRR you prepared for some swashbuckling fun. Here's where we encounter a dozen familiar terms. Privateers, buccaneers, corsairs, and filibusters. These terms were coined in various countries, but they all refer to the same thing, a legalized pirate. During times of war, countries such as France, Holland, and England issued instructions to pirates, specifying which ships they were allowed to attack. Along with this authorization, these pirates held documents that protected them within their territories, with the backing of such documents, pirates could calmly enter state ports, restock provisions, and be respected individuals. There are countless instances where pirates transition from their illicit activities to official positions in the Navy, often attaining high-ranking positions. A notable example is Sir Francis Drake, an English pirate known for his raids on Spanish ships. At one point, he even sent Queen Elizabeth a humble gift equivalent to the annual income of an entire country. As a result, Francis was knighted, granted a noble title, and became an honorary citizen of England. He was also provided with legal protection against Spain. Our guest, Marcus Rashford, known as Barbarossa, operates at a lower level. The year is 1718, which many consider the golden age of piracy. Unfortunately, it is also the final year for many pirates, as most of them were eradicated. But we'll get to that later. For now, let's focus on the environment surrounding our Barbarossa. He and his vessel find themselves in the city of Nassau, which still holds the title of the capital of the Bahamas. Marcus purposely made a stop there because he is an official member of the Coastal Brotherhood. In 1706, this united brotherhood of pirates successfully captured the Bahamas, and Nassau became the capital of the so-called Pirate Republic. Complete with its own flag, Legally speaking, the islands belonged to England, but in reality, the British administration withdrew, and the pirates defended against attacks from the Spanish and the French using available ships and the fort. 
There are numerous tales of pirate states in books and movies, but the Pirate Republic in Nassau stands as the most substantial entity that truly resembled a mini-state. Marcus commands a vessel named Happy Delivery, as pirates had a penchant for giving their ships catchy names. In the 20th century, researcher Marcus Redeker analyzed the nicknames of pirate ships and discovered that 18% of them included the word, revenge. Additionally, 15% of pirates added, tramp, to their ship's name, and another 10% made references to queens, symbolizing authority. One notable example is the legendary ship, Queen Anne's Revenge, belonging to Blackbeard, which also appeared in the films about Jack Sparrow. As you can see, such names aim to instill fear and psychological impact on their victims. While Marcus's vessel, Happy Delivery, may be significantly smaller than Queen Anne's Revenge, it only requires a crew of around 30. Its compact size, however, facilitates swift boarding. Barbarossa and his crew simply ram the target vessel and board through the holds, leaving opponents with little time to react. Boarding such a tiny boat from a cannon is nearly impossible, giving rise to the vessel's intimidating name. The pirates of the Caribbean movies do an admirable job of capturing the costumes and appearance of pirate crews, these rugged individuals often adorn their bodies with an array of tattoos. The purpose of these tattoos extended beyond mere aesthetics, as criminals during that time were frequently branded. Spaniards used to burn the letter P with a crown on a pirate's body. The French marked them with lilies and bourbon symbols, while the British often tattooed anchors and changing coat of arms. It's safe to assume that around 80% of Marcus's crew are former criminals, and it's equally plausible that these pirates concealed their criminal marks beneath their tattoos. Pirates were incredibly superstitious. They cherished amulets, talismans, and bandages, believing they brought luck and protection. They dipped lead bullets in silver or gold to guard against treacherous shots. A bear's tooth ensured a safe return home, while Neptune's anchor aided navigation. Pirates believed that carrying a small battle axe guaranteed victory in upcoming battles. In addition, pirates were fascinated by astrology and often wore their zodiac signs on chains. But perhaps the most exotic detail is the Bradham amulet. Our Barbarossa possesses one, and his friend, Anthony Long, has a similar amulet. The essence of the amulet is simple. A small cactus vessel containing a drop of blood from a person whom you consider a brother. Pirates would exchange blood, seal the vessel with wax, and bid farewell. If one day Marcus receives the amulet of a comrade, he must drop everything and rush to their aid. The Pirate Brotherhood is no trivial matter. However, you won't see the Jolly Roger flag flying above Marcus's ship. Instead, the Union Jack of England waves proudly. In the hold, you'll find the flags of France, the Netherlands, and other significant states. Alongside those flags, you'll spot a red flag adorned with a skull, crossbones, and other cheerful symbols of pirate life. The black and white Jolly Roger flag wouldn't make its way into the Oxford Dictionary until 1724. This is quite understandable since sailing under that flag on the high seas is like painting a target on your own ship. In the majority of cases, pirates sailed under the flags of their respective nations, as many held letters of mark and other licenses. It reduced the chances of receiving a volley of cannon fire. When raiding a French vessel, for instance, it was easier to approach under the French flag, minimizing the enemy's preparation time. Only after that would the pirates hoist one of the various available flags. Each flag had its own purpose. Captain Richard Hawkins elaborated on this in his logbook. Captured in 1724, Hawkins stated that if pirates approach you under a black flag resembling the Jolly Roger, it generally indicated their willingness to negotiate surrender. However, if they approached under a red flag, there was no chance of mercy, and you had to prepare for battle. Let us emphasize that despite all the romantic notions, pirates were shrewd individuals. Their highest chance of victory lay in launching sudden attacks. Hence, Marcus often approached Spanish ships under the Spanish flag to avoid arousing suspicion, and prominently displayed on the ship was a code signed by all members of the crew. One of the pioneers of this practice was the legendary pirate Henry Morgan, known for his ruthless raids, 
who eventually gained favor with British authorities and even became the Lieutenant Governor of Jamaica. All of this was thanks to the code, violation of which sometimes resulted in lethal consequences. Each captain could devise their own code, and that's where the Jack Sparrow movies deviate a bit. There was no single standardized code for all pirates. If desired, a captain would create their own, and the crew members would affix their signatures. For example, the personal code of Francis Drake, though in spoken, ensured that even the lowliest cabin boy received a share of the spoils after a battle. Captain Drake often remained in the red to reward every hard-working member of his crew. Of course, a few myths surround pirates. One of the most prevalent is their drunkenness. Now, you might think that pirates were a bunch of drunken scallywags. But truth be told, most ships at sea were as dry as a desert. Being a pirate ain't no easy job, matey. It requires focus and concentration. And let's face it, a crew sloshed with grog would end up at the bottom of the ocean faster than you can say, shiver me timbers. Gambling was another favorite pastime of pirates, but they saved their dice rolling adventures for ports and solid ground. On the ship, they ran like a well-oiled machine, with each pirate knowing their place, and those eye patches? Well, some say they were just pirates preparing their eyes for a trip to the dark hole, ARRR. They closed one eye to get accustomed to the semi-darkness like a bunch of one-eyed pirates. Now, let's not even talk about treasures, me hearties. The life of a pirate was short and sweet, so there was no point in saving for the future. Few of those scallywags made it to old age, savvy? But let's set sail to the Pirate Republic in the Bahamas, where our very own Marcus sets anchor. Back in 1706, things got mighty interesting, ye see? The big wars between nations came to an end, and they realized it was cheaper to negotiate over a nice cup of tea instead of battling it out at sea. So, the demand for pirates serving kings disappeared faster than a bottle of rum at a pirate party. Instead, many pirates gathered in the Bahamas, creating a small independent state. And guess who became a popular resident? None other than the infamous Edward Teach, or as we know him, Blackbeard. Arg, he was one feisty pirate. The Bahamas had a bunch of other powerful corsairs too, all united by one thing, freedom. Our Marcus, a true plunderer of ships, knew he could come back to the Bahamas for some well-deserved R&R. But, alas, the pirates' freedom came under attack. The Republic didn't even have a proper leader, matey. On paper, they said Benjamin Hornigold was the head honcho, but in reality, it meant less than a parrot's squawk. The Bahamas had no courts, no laws, nothing but pure pirate freedom. But then, in 1717, England suddenly remembered they had legal rights over the island. I, they decided to send Woods Rogers, a former pirate turned fancy British military man, to tame the pirate republic. And guess what? Rogers came bearing a treasure that caught the pirate council's attention, an amnesty document. They be offering all the pirates a chance to become subjects of the British Empire. In return, all their past crimes would be forgiven. The catch? They had to follow the Empire's rules. Ha! Huh? Like pirates cared about written rules. Many of them, including Blackbeard himself, said, Nay, thanks. To the amnesty. So, ye can imagine what happened next, me hearties. The majority of those rebellious pirates met their watery graves while the survivors either became British subjects or went into hiding like a bunch of scared little crabs. And what did our fearless Marcus choose? Ah, that be a mystery we can ponder over while sipping our rum. One thing's for sure, those pirates, despite their wicked ways, had a sense of honor. But let's not get too carried away, folks. Pirates were still scoundrels and thieves, but with their own twisted code, mind ye, the times were dark and dangerous, so in those medieval days, the pirates might have been the most democratic bunch around. Until we meet again, me hearty adventurers, keep sailing the seven seas, and remember, it's all about the pirate life, yar.